Thanks to you at home for joining us this hour. Very happy to have you with us. So the great state of Kansas uh, is a red state, has been for a long while now. In the 2016 presidential election, Kansas went for Donald Trump over Hillary Clinton by something like 20 points, 21 points. Just a blowout in 2016. But two years after that blowout in the 2018 election, which just happened in November, Kansas voters elected a Democrat as their governor. Her name is Laura Kelly. On that same night that Laura Kelly was elected Kansas governor, an incumbent Republican congressman from Kansas, Kevin Yoder, he also lost his seat to a Democrat. He lost his congressional seat to a Native American gay Democratic woman named Sharice Davids. And amid all of the glass ceilings that Sharice Davids smashed through in order to get that seat off Kevin Yoder, it's also just sort of a partisan wonder that there is a Democrat in the Kansas congressional delegation, but Sharice Davids is that. And then it, uh, it just kind of didn't stop on election night. Since midterm election night in November, there's been a little mini landslide of incumbent Republican members of the state legislature switching parties in Kansas. Since election night, four different members of the Kansas state legislature ditched the Republican Party and proclaimed that henceforth they are Democrats. And, you know, I mean, no, still nobody's going to argue that Kansas should be called a blue state. Even with the defections of all those state legislators since election night, both the state House and the state Senate are still really bright red in Kansas. But with Sharice Davids taking that Republican incumbent congressional seat and with Laura Kelly taking the governorship and with these four members of the state legislature flipping from Republican to Democrat, now, Kansas is still red, but it is it's starting to take on a sort of light purple tinge around the edges. Uh, and here's another thing that has just happened in Kansas. You might remember that before the midterm elections this, this year, our show actually spent a pretty good amount of time in Kansas, specifically in a famous and historic town called Dodge City, which is fan gun smoke tastic. Jacqueline, you take Bulow. And you take the rest of your men. And you get out of Dodge. You get out of Dodge. Dodge City of Gunsmoke fame. Dodge City is in southwest Kansas. Uh, they do still celebrate the old Gunsmoke vibe. There is a gunfighter's wax museum there. In, it coincident with the Kansas Teachers Hall of Fame. It's an awkward pairing, but, you know, they both pay rent. Uh, these days, Dodge City's industrial base is meatpacking. And that meatpacking industry has attracted a lot of Hispanic workers and their families. Dodge City, Kansas is now a majority minority town. It's majority Hispanic. And the reason we ended up spending some time there before the midterm elections this past year is because Republican elected officials in red state Kansas made some striking decisions when it came to voting in Dodge City, which is the largest majority minority community in that entire state. When Laura Kelly, the Democrat, was running for governor in Kansas this past November, the Republican candidate she was up against was named Chris Kobach. He's known nationally as somewhat of a national profile, in part because he was the head of President Trump's sort of bogus and now disbanded voter fraud commission. Chris Kobach has also made somewhat of a national name for himself in recent years, trying to sell other states besides Kansas on policies that are designed to make it as hard as possible for likely Democratic voters to cast their vote and get it counted. While he was running for Kansas governor this past November, he was simultaneously serving as the secretary of state in Kansas, as the top elections official in that state. And under his leadership, it was decided that Dodge City, the largest majority minority town in the whole state, it was decided that they would be relieved of their one voting place, their one polling location. There's like 13,000-ish registered voters in Dodge City. They were already in pretty bad shape in terms of access to the polls before this past election. For those 13,000 voters, <laughs> there was precisely one voting place in all of Dodge City before this last election. But then for the midterms, for the November elections in which Chris Kobach was going to be top of the ballot as the Republican candidate for governor, for the midterms, Republican officials in Kansas decided that that one polling place in Dodge City was one polling place too many. And so that polling place would be shut. 
They said it was because uh, construction was going to make that one polling place in Dodge City inaccessible, so they closed that one voting place for the whole town and instead opened up another one way outside the city limits. Um, so that's why we sent a staffer there. We sent a producer from the show to go to Dodge to see if there was any observable ground truth here, right? If there was any rhyme or reason to this, this claim from Republican elected officials in the state who decided that 13,000 mostly Hispanic voters in Dodge City, Kansas should be afforded precisely zero places to vote in their town. The first thing we learned when we got to Dodge is that the new polling place that they opened outside the city limits was hard to get to with a car. It was impossible to get to without one. The second thing we learned by visiting Dodge City was that the ostensible reason for closing the one polling place in town, the supposed construction at the traditional polling place, did not really seem to be much of anything that was directly impinging on access to that polling place. There were plenty of other events being staged at that location where the polling place had been. There was no kind of mass disruption that might justify what they were trying to get away with. The whole thing seemed even more suspicious when we learned that county election officials had sent notices to new voters in Dodge City that contained the wrong address for their new outside city limits polling place. The situation seemed to get even worse than that. When the ACLU of Kansas wrote to the local elections officials, the county, county official who had, who had moved the polling place outside of town and who had sent out the wrong address for it, the ACLU wrote to that county election official asking for her help in publicizing a voter helpline that would contain the correct polling place information. That top county elections official forwarded that email from the ACLU. She forwarded, forwarded it to Chris Kobach to the office of the Republican Secretary of State, adding her own caption to this help that the ACLU had asked for. What she added to that email was her own commentary, and it was, I quote, LOL. This is what I got in the mail from the ACLU, LOL. Which in this case means, of course, no, I'm not going to give you any help publicizing the true address. After all that, the ACLU sued. They argued what was happening in Dodge City was illegal. It was for one thing, disenfranchising Hispanic voters in that town. One of the named plaintiffs in that case was a very impressive young man named Alejandro Rangel Lopez, 18 years old, a local high school senior. He told us that for his 18th birthday last year, he was super psyched to be able to vote for the first time, but he really wanted to be able to vote in the town where he lives, and so he thought that was worth fighting for. My family is immigrants, my friends are immigrants, this community is made up of immigrants. And many of those are undocumented or are DACA, DACA recipients or are dreamers. And they don't have the right to vote or have any other rights uh, that citizens like myself have. And as instilled by my parents, it's very important that people who have the opportunity to vote exercise that right to vote and do anything possible to make it easier or to make their voice heard about issues that are important to them. In the end, Alejandro did not get to vote inside city limits in Dodge City in the 2018 election. Uh, despite the lawsuit, a, a judge ruled that it was too close to election day to make any changes to the planned polling places for November's midterm election, so everybody who wanted to vote in Dodge City had to figure out some way to get to this out-of-town location. But now, tonight we can tell you, that the next time there's an election in Dodge City, which is going to be primary elections in August of this year, for the next election in Dodge City, people will be actually allowed to vote inside city limits um, because that lawsuit worked. All that pressure, all of that fight caused the Republican county election clerk to finally give in. They've now announced, okay, fine. They will announce and open two new polling places inside the city limits in Dodge City, and they will be ready for this year's primaries. Um, Alejandro and LULAC, which is the League of United Latin, Latin American Citizens, uh, and the ACLU, they filed a voluntary motion to dismiss their lawsuit once that announcement was made by the county because they got what they were after. And so, you know, it, they didn't get it in time for the midterms, but they got it. Sometimes when you fight, you win. Sometimes when you are fighting in an environment that seems absolutely unforgiving and impossible, sometimes the environment changes around you and it allows you to win. I mean, one of the places that Democrat Laura Kelly campaigned for governor 
when she was on her way to winning the state house. One of the places she campaigned was in Dodge City. What she campaigned on there? Improving voters' access to the polls. Well, now voters' access to the polls is improved in Dodge City, and she's in charge of state government, and Chris Kobach is unemployed. But again, ground truth in Dodge City, this next time you will no longer have to leave town to vote like you did before. I mean, there's still, there's still a couple of things to watch here. Uh, the case was dismissed without prejudice, which means that case can come back to life pretty much instantly if the plaintiffs come to believe that they need to do that in order to hold the county and hold the state to account, right, to make sure that Hispanic voters are getting equal treatment in that town and in Kansas. It can come back. That's what dismissing it without prejudice means. And if you think about it, it is still a little bit nuts that for 13,000 voters, there's only two planned polling places in Dodge City. But it's better. I mean, at least two polling places is two more than what they had, which is zero. So it's, it's not like that fight is permanently over. But they did win what they were trying to get. And a win is a win for Alejandro and for the ACLU and for the voters in that town who are not going to take it lying down. And it does show you that things change, even in places where it seems like they cannot ever change. Things change. Kansas voted for Trump by 20 points. Two years later, they voted for Laura Kelly to become the Democratic governor of that state. That same night that Laura Kelly became the Democratic governor of Kansas, that's the same night, of course, that Democrats won control of the House of Representatives in Washington. And over these last few days, we have started to see the substance of what that is going to mean in terms of how your federal government works, how Congress works, how it spends its time, what it works on. The first bill the Democrats brought up and held hearings on is what they call H.R. 1. It's a big omnibus bill on voting rights and anti-corruption measures. This is legislation that sort of hits all the high points on small d democratic reform. It would stop uh, partisan gerrymandering for congressional districts. So instead of having state legislatures draw up the congressional districts to maximally benefit their own party, instead it would be independent, nonpartisan redistricting in every state. So you don't have all these guaranteed Republican seats or guaranteed Democratic seats. And it would be all across the country. It would make Election Day a federal holiday. So nobody has to skip voting because they can't get time off work to do it. It would guarantee early voting days for every federal election in every state in the country. Right now, some states offer early voting, some don't. It would establish nationwide voter registration, where you have the opportunity to opt out if you don't want to be registered, but otherwise, you're registered. It would stop states from dumping registered voters off their rolls in purges like the ones that are advocated nationwide by Chris Kobach. It would make the, the president and the Supreme Court subject to the same ethics and anti-corruption rules as everybody else in government. Imagine that. It would force dark money groups and super PACs to have to disclose their donors. So we'd have no more anonymous money flooding into election campaigns. When the, when the Democrats first introduced this legislation, you always pick something to be HR1, right? To show this is our first priority. This is what we want to be known for as we take the gavel. When the Democrats first put forward this legislation, I don't think the Republicans worried too much about it or even thought too much about it at first. But when the Democrats held their first hearings on H.R. 1 this week and the Republican witnesses just got roasted and Republican members of Congress had a very hard time mounting sober sounding arguments against many of the elements of this bill, particularly the anti-corruption stuff. Um, I, th I think the Republicans started to take the threat and the potential appeal of this legislation more seriously. This is a House bill, but in response to this House bill, Senator Mitch McConnell got up on the floor of the Senate and called it a power grab. Democratic Senator Brian Schatz of Hawaii clapped back at him. Yes, voting is a power grab by citizens. One of the other elements of H.R. 1 that that never would have been controversial, let alone a partisan issue as recently as just a few years ago, uh, is a provision that would require candidates for vice president and candidates for president to disclose their tax returns to the public or they wouldn't be allowed to run. The Donald Trump presidential candidacy was the first time since Nixon that a presidential candidate hasn't disclosed his or her tax returns, let alone uh, an actual sitting president not disclosing his or her tax returns. But despite that stark break from bipartisan precedent and ongoing questions about what it is about his tax returns that he did not want to disclose, Republicans absolutely 
decided not to care. <laughs> At least they decided not to do anything about that when they held unified control of Congress for the first two years of the Trump presidency. Today, we learned that will change under the new Democratic leadership in this Congress. Next week on Thursday, the subcommittee led by Congressman John Lewis, subcommittee in Ways and Means, will convene the first hearing that has ever happened on candidate tax returns. The first tax returns hearing since Donald Trump became the first major party candidate to refuse to release his. The hearing will be called Legislative Proposals and Tax Law Related to Presidential and Vice Presidential Tax Returns. Again, this is in the context of proposed Democratic legislation that would make it a requirement that all vice presidential and presidential candidates have to disclose them if they want to run. That hearing will be a week from today, 2 o'clock. They're going to live stream it. Um, already in the, the few days that they have been up and running in Congress since the shutdown ended, Democrats have convened hearings on drug companies hiking the price of prescription drugs. You might remember the polling around the election time that showed that health care and health care costs were the single greatest motivating factor for Americans who turned out to vote in this year's elections. Those voters, when they turned out, elected Democrats by a historic margin. They flipped 40 Republican seats to the Democratic Party. Democrats know that. They know anger and fear and concern about health care costs is a big part of what drove voters to pick them and put them in office. And so the first full day of hearings under the Democratic, under the Democratic Congress included aggressive hearings on drug companies hiking the price of their drugs. Democrats have also convened hearings on the president's uh, remarkable and as yet explicitly unjustified decision to send thousands of U.S. troops to the border right before the midterm elections. Was that a presidential stunt that was designed to have a political impact and for no other substantive reason? It's at least worth asking. Democrats have started already. Next week on Wednesday, for the first time in eight years, there will be a House hearing on climate change. Actually, there's going to be two, one in the Energy Committee and one in the Natural Resources Committee. The chairs of those committees are Democrats now, Raul Grijalva and Frank Pallone, both Democrats, neither of whom believe that climate change is a hoax invented by the Chinese that is easily disproven by the continued existence of winter. Next week, for the first time in eight years, there will also be a congressional hearing on gun violence. Think about that for a second. Eight years? There has not been a House hearing on gun violence in eight years. That means through... Sandy Hook, and through Aurora, Colorado, and through the Navy Yard shootings, and what happened in San Bernardino, and Orlando, the Pulse nightclub shooting, and Las Vegas, and Sutherland Springs, Texas, where 27 people were shot and killed, and the Pittsburgh Synagogue Massacre, and Parkland, Florida, through all of these. And those are just, like, off the top of my head. I mean, those are just some of them, right? I mean, the House has held zero hearings. They have had zero response. They have paid zero attention to anything having to do with all of these gun massacres in the country. They actually thought about having a hearing on gun violence in 2017. They got close, but then it was called off because of the congressional baseball game shooting. In 2016, after what happened at the Pulse nightclub in Orlando, where 50 people were killed, another 53 were shot and wounded. After that one, that was when Congressman John Lewis led Democratic members of the House in a sit-in on the floor of Congress. They sat in, remember that? They sat in overnight for 25 hours, demanding that the Republicans allow some kind of vote on some kind of gun reform, some kind of response, anything. Republicans did nothing in response. Nothing. Not a hearing, not even a hearing to talk about it in eight years. Well, now next week with the Democrats in charge, there will be a gun violence hearing. It'll be in the Judiciary Committee. California Congressman Ted Lieu is on that committee. When that hearing was announced, he said online, quote, the American people delivered control of the House to Democrats. What does that mean? No more stupid hearings about Hillary's emails. Instead, next Wednesday, House Judiciary will hold a hearing on gun violence. Next Thursday, we will pass a bill on background checks. And the House will hold all of these hearings. And they will, in all likelihood, pass a ton of stuff. Nancy Pelosi is very good at managing her caucus so that when stuff comes to the floor, it comes to the floor because they knew, know who's going to vote for it and they bring stuff to the floor because they want it to pass and then they pass it. Now, when they pass stuff in the House, will any of that go anywhere? Will any of this 
pressure from Congress change anything? The attention that they can bring to stuff through hearings, will it change anything? Will it make new policy? I know they'll be able to pass bills in the House. Does that mean they'll be able to pass new laws? There's the Senate, there's the White House. I don't know, but the prospect of what they are doing already all of a sudden makes Congress way more relevant than it has been in a long time. Democrats and um, some observers who do not want to be quoted um, are, are already suggesting that even looking at some of that stuff that's in the Democrats' big, big HR1 bill, some of the anti-corruption measures in that bill, if they're broken out alone, some of those might be too hard for Republicans to resist. Some of those might get sufficient Republican support. They could potentially become law. Well, I mean, we'll see. There are real signs that things could actually change and maybe in short order on issues related to foreign policy, where even Republicans in the Senate appear willing to break with the president from time to time. The number of Republican senators who crossed over and voted with Democrats to try to stop the Trump administration from lifting Russian sanctions on Oleg Deripaska, that number of Republican crossovers was not sufficient to stop the administration. They needed a couple more votes, but it did hit double digits. And in the House, it was well over 100 Republicans who joined with the Democrats to try to tr stop the Trump administration on that, too. Today, Senate Republicans got behind a legislative rebuke of the president on Syria and Afghanistan. The president has tweeted stuff that looks like potentially he's ordering U.S. troops out of Syria and Afghanistan. It's really just his Twitter feed, and it's not quite clear what he's trying to do and what he might actually be doing. But Senate Republicans showed today they're, they're willing at least to, to rebuke him on issues like that. And that dynamic will be fascinating to watch, regardless of what you think about whether there ought to be more American troops in Syria and Afghanistan and for how long. I mean, the idea that Congress, even the Republican-controlled side of the Congress and the Senate, that they might get up on their hind legs on issues like that and express themselves and take back some of their power on an issue like that, that would be a huge thing. I mean, war powers and decisions about authorizing the use of American military force have accrued increasingly to the presidency for a couple of generations now. For every president since Vietnam, increasingly and inexorably, it has been this one-way swing of U.S. military power being consolidated within the presidency. Decision-making power and authority over U.S. military force being consolidated in the executive. I wrote a book about it in 2012 I called, called Drift, in which I did not anticipate that the thing that might ever turn that drift around would be the election of a president who was so widely perceived on a bipartisan basis to be manifestly unfit to wield those kinds of concentrated powers when it comes to U.S. force. But that's where we're at. It has taken a Trump presidency to swing the pendulum now back in the other direction, to the point where Congress now maybe wants to assert that just like the Constitution says, actually, war and the use of military force is something that Congress is supposed to decide, not just the president alone. And so we will see. The realm of what is possible, the realm of what you might be able to achieve if you fight for it, is something that is in flux right now in America. I mean, just, just ask Dodge City, Kansas, and their two new polling places, and their Democratic governor, and their deep red legislature that gets slightly bluer every day every time a new legislator jumps out of the Republican Party and declares herself to be a Democrat. I mean, we will see things are in flux. And some of the things people have been fighting for that seemed like hopeless causes, all of a sudden are going to be causes that win this year. We are in that kind of an inflection moment. But the one place in national politics where we don't have to wait and see, where the change is already happening, where there has been a passing of the gavel in terms of who is empowered to make things happen and to say how things will end, that is in the realm of oversight. And we broke the news here last night about the Democrat who has just now newly been empowered as of now to take that gavel. Republicans delayed it as long as they could, but he is finally now being allowed to start his work. He is about to become one of the most powerful figures in Washington and one of the most powerful Democrats in the country. And he joins us live next. Hey there, I'm Chris Hayes from MSNBC. Thanks for watching MSNBC on YouTube. If you want to keep up to date with the videos we're putting out, you can click subscribe just below me or click over on this list to see lots of other great videos.